turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 22. In the first part of Daniel chapter 7, we're given a great deal of information. In this part of the chapter, it begins the interpretation. And so I'm entitling this morning's message, The Vision's Interpretation. From Daniel chapter 7, verses 15 through 22. Pray with me, won't you? Heavenly Father... We are so grateful for Jesus, our King who has come, and the King who is coming. Lord, at this time of the year, we celebrate Advent, but also, Lord, we know that the Bible has a great deal to say about the second Advent, that Jesus is coming again. And Heavenly Father, again, as we look out in the world in which we live, we see the signs not only of broken nations, but broken people. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would provide comfort and hope. And so, Father, we commit this time to you. We pray that you'd prepare our hearts for communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet and the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows, I was watching. And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. In this particular passage, we see the rise of the four kingdoms, the replacement by an eternal kingdom, and then the revelation of what's going to happen in part in the future. You'll remember in this seventh chapter of Daniel, he's speaking again about the first vision that Daniel will receive. There's another vision that awaits us. So the In the first and the third years of Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel receives these two visions of future Gentile world powers. In the final part of the chapter, well, in the first part of the chapter, Daniel's given information concerning the four beasts in verses 1 through 8. Also, two supernatural beings in verses 9 through 14. The Bible calls these beings the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. The first being is God himself. The Ancient of Days is seated on his heavenly throne, judging the earth. A river of fire flows from God's presence. Millions of angels minister to him in verse 10. Millions and millions upon millions and millions 
await judgment. The fourth beast is cast into hell in verses 11 and 12. Another being, the Son of Man is given a glorious, eternal kingdom. And so now Daniel asks for the interpretation and it is given by an angelic being who stands near him in verse 16. So again, we see the rise of the four kingdoms. Look what it says again in verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are for are for kings, which we know represent kingdoms. We see the picture of Nebuchadnezzar. We see a picture of Cyrus. We see a picture of Alexander. And certainly we see brief glimpses of people like Caesar, like Augustus Caesar, like Nero, and then this future king who is an antichrist figure. So again, he will ask for the interpretation and he says, they stood near and they arise out of the earth. And so what is the immediate response of Daniel from the vision? He tells us, he's anxious, he's alarmed, he's horrified. Why? Again, I want you to think about what you're reading. We know the reason in part. Daniel has been given a brief glimpse of heaven, of the future, of the outcome of all of mankind. It, it is a future where the world experiences judgment as a result of sin. And sometimes you get brief glimpses of judgment because of sin, as sin takes its toll in human lives. This grieves Daniel. He is grieved by this. His example should be our how we embrace it as well. When you see sin around you, it should grieve you. We used to sing a song about broken lives and ruined people. And this is the reason why Jesus came and died on Calvary's cross. Later, Daniel will write, as for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed. And I kept the matter in my heart, it says in verse 28. In other words, when he began to consider all that he had seen and all that was told him, literally the color drained from his face. That's the meaning. <laughs> Daniel is in distress in verse 15. He approaches a celestial being. He confesses his inability to process what he's seeing in verse 16. And at this point, he's been the recipient of the vision, but he doesn't necessarily understand all of its content. I'm going to suggest to you that he has a pretty good handle on the first three beasts, but this fourth beast has caused him some consternation. He does not understand what he is seeing. And Daniel doesn't dare draw any conclusion without seeking divine guidance, without asking for help to understand what it is that he's seeing. And, and by the way, we see this pattern repeated over and over in the scriptures. When someone receives a vision from God, it's usually terrifying. In the ancient world, particularly in the Old Testament, if an angel showed up or God gave a vision, most people thought they were dying. In Genesis chapter 20, it records the sad sojourn of Abraham in Gerar. Jonathan taught from this a couple of weeks ago from Genesis chapter 20. In that passage, Abraham begs Sarah to tell the king, Abimelech, 
that she, that is Sarah, is his sister. And in doing that, he puts the whole prophetic plan at risk because God has promised Abraham and Sarah a baby. And so the Lord appears to Abimelech, the king of Gerar, in a dream. And the first words out of God's mouth are, indeed, you're a dead man. You laugh. Yeah. If all of a sudden the eternal God shows up in a dream and says, <clears throat> we have an idiomatic expression in our culture. You're dead meat. You're a dead man. Because of the woman whom you've taken. For she's a, a man's wife. Nebuchadnezzar, troubled, his sleep flees from him in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Paul's vision of a supernatural being on the Damascus road leaves him blind and humbled and wondering whether or not he has a true understanding of reality. He has yet another vision and whether he's in the body or out of the body, he doesn't know. John in the book of Revelation, when he sees the glorified Jesus, it says in Revelation chapter one, verse 17, it says, I became like a dead man. This should cause you to wonder when people on TV say, yeah, you know, Jesus showed up while I was shaving this morning. And what? You're still alive? <laughs> Daniel had interpreted the dreams of others. And he was genuinely gifted at discerning the meaning. And he is wholly at a loss to process his own vision. So in this vision, he makes inquiry of a being standing by in verse 16. Again, in the passage, as you're looking at it, we need to ask ourselves this question. Again, why does Daniel want to know the truth about the vision? Think about what's going on. He wants to know the meaning. He understands from Jeremiah that the people of Israel are going to return to the land, he understands because of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and his own vision that there's some sort of distance between what's going to happen and the coming of the Messiah. He knows that there is pain and suffering ahead. His attention isn't focused on the first three creatures, but the final creature. He begins to ask himself the question, why is this beast so ferocious and cruel? He wants to know more about these bizarre horns, the ten horns, why three fall, why, why the small horn grows greater and greater, and why he speaks such blasphemy, such arrogance, and the presence of interpreting angels, by the way, is another theme that occurs in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Zechariah, where these prophets receive these visions and an interpreting angel comes along and then tells them the meaning. By the way, that scenario never appears in a Syrian Babylonian or Mesopotamian literature. And so again, for the people who think, hey, the, this whole thing is just borrowed from pagan cultures, it's, it's not true. We're not given the angelic being's name. But many scholars have suggested that this is probably Gabriel, who's playing a prominent role in both the interpretation of the future visions and the announcements that are going to take place from the Messiah. How do we know that? If you peek ahead or if you've read ahead in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, Gabriel is instructed, quote, make this man understand the vision, it says in chapter 8. And later, Daniel writes in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. It's Gabriel who will announce to Zechariah the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary in Luke chapter 11, verse 11, and then later in chapter 11, verses 26 through 38. 
And then in verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which represent kingdoms. And we talked in brief about those. A nation like a lion with eagle's wings is Babylon in verse 4. A nation like a bear is Medo-Persia in verse 5. The nation like the leopard with wings and heads, four of them, is Greece in verse 6. There is a nation that is exceeding strong, that pulverizes the people around it, the Roman Empire in verse 7. And again, like I've said, they correspond to notable leaders, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Alexander the Great, and this mysterious figure, this future figure that he calls the little horn that becomes the prominent horn, who is the Antichrist. So how do these kingdoms correspond to some contemporary kingdoms or future kingdoms? Are we to believe that all of these kingdoms are past with still one future? What do we do? How do we think about it? What do all of these kingdoms have in common? The earthly ones are man-centered. They're violent. They're corrupt. They come, they go, they bring sorrow, they bring pain, they bring suffering and insecurity and distress and chaos. They bring persecution to the saints. And so we see something happening, the replacement by a forever kingdom. In verse 18 it says, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. There's a couple of things that you should note right off the bat. Number one, that word, but the saints of the Most High. The, this is the first appearance of the word saint in the book of Daniel. So there are in fact five kingdoms how do we know that? Four are human. One is divine. Four are temporary. One is eternal. Once again, Daniel is given hope. Now, again, I want you to think about what the angelic being is saying. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. This is hope. This immediate tells us that kingdoms come and go and conquest and cruelty will come and go. And note, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. This is important because they don't take the kingdom. In other words, Christians aren't jihadis in the sense of we don't conquer people. We don't cruelly imprison them, execute them. Christianity, if there's if there's anything about Christianity that should note Christianity, it isn't the imposition of our faith. It's the reality. Now, again, I understand that we've lived in a world where some people have tried to manipulate people and, and trick them or manipulate them into receiving the kingdom, but that's not what the Bible says. We receive it in verse 18. The saints possess it in verse 22. It's given to them in verse 27. All of this is important. The reception, the possession, the gifting. All comes from the Most High God. El Elyon. In other words, the receiving of the kingdom, the possessing of the kingdom, the gifting of this kingdom. It comes from the Lord. A kingdom is on the horizon, a glorious kingdom, an eternal kingdom. And in this single sentence, God, Daniel knows that God is going to prevail, that Israel has a bright future and a wonderful hope. True believers within Israel are going to come. They're, they're going to see the coming of the Messiah. There is going to be a time when the Messiah is going to come and the people of God are going to be able to serve him forever. And we understand some things. The kingdom is universal. 
And so if you think about the Old Testament and now you think about the New Testament, the kingdom is mentioned some 70 times in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, the very first message out of the very first messenger's mouth is repent for the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom includes everything seen and unseen, material as well as spiritual. The kingdom is announced at Christ's birth. It's set up at his return. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus calls it the gospel of the kingdom. Angels are a part of God's kingdom. And saints are a part of the kingdom. And Satan and demons are answerable to the kingdom. Men are to seek the kingdom first. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Believers enter this kingdom at the new birth. The unsaved can't see it according to John chapter 3 verse 3 and again in verse 5. The kingdom is characterized by righteousness Peace and joy in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. And so if, per, if a person suggests this is the kingdom and it isn't characterized by righteousness and peace and joy, it's not the kingdom. If a person says to you, I have the kingdom of God in my heart, but their heart isn't characterized by righteousness and peace, Enjoy. They're not being entirely honest with you. According to the Bible, this kingdom cannot be inherited by flesh and blood in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. So again, as you look at this in this first mention of the saints, who are these? Who are these saints of the Most High? Some have suggested that this is a reference to supernatural beings, celestial beings, the word is used that way in Old Testament literature, certainly. But there are biblical examples of the phrase being used in reference to human beings. The word translated saints means holy people. The ones who are set apart. Now the implication is that these holy beings, these holy beings who are set apart, they're set apart from sin and they're set apart to God. The idea is always contains those two elements. And this is important because they're set apart to the most high. And remember, in our study in the book of Daniel, we've been looking carefully at that title of God, El Elyon. It's a word that speaks not so much of God as the creator, although he is the creator, but it speaks of his authority within that creation. So this is the God who has universal authority. This is the same title that was used by Melchizedek when he greeted Abraham this is the same title that was used by Nebuchadnezzar. And for the Jew, it was a title that meant that Yahweh was not only the true God, but that all other gods were fundamentally and forever false gods. The people I'm going to suggest to you that are being spoken of here aren't necessarily intrinsically holy. Well, Gino, you just contradicted yourself because you said that they're set apart from sin and they're separated towards God. That's true. But does this mean that they have a perfect holiness? No. What makes them separated from sin and what makes them separated towards God? It's the idea that they are trusting this Lord. See, part of what you need to be able to understand that you may not be able to understand or you really have a hard time grasping is that people have always been saved exactly the same way. 
They've had to trust that God would make a provision for their sin. That he himself would make a provision for sin. And so I'm going to suggest to you that these are individuals who are made holy as they trust in the coming Messiah or who have been made holy because they trust that the Messiah has come. And that's the idea. And so, some suggest that it's a reference to saints in every age. Others suggest that it's a reference to the church. Still others suggest that it's a reference to believing Jews. Some scholars argue that Daniel deals with the Jewish people and the church hasn't even come into existence until the New Testament dispensation. And I would suggest to you that that's true. The church at this point doesn't exist. But when it's reflecting the message that's being given, the church has already come into existence because this is a reference to this coming kingdom. So how are we to make sense of all of this? Who are the recipients of this future kingdom? I'm going to suggest to you that an argument could be made that all the saints will one day inherit the future kingdom. But the immediate context seems to reference Jews. These are Jews who are redeemed at the end of time. These are Jewish people who seem to have made the decision that maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah, but in the midst of this profound and terrible and horrible persecution, many of them are going to come and recognize that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Ron Rhodes points out that the Armageddon event that seems to be the historical context, and again, this is a future context, in which Israel experiences a major conversion event. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. You'll remember that there's this vision of seeing the Messiah coming. His hands are pierced, and they look on him, and they weep as a person who's lost an only child. He writes, and I quote, in terms of chronology, Israel's future restoration will include the confession of Israel's national sin. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40 through 42. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 11. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. And then the remnant of Jews will be saved, thereby fulfilling Paul's prophecy of Israel in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. In dire threat from the Antichrist at Armageddon, Israel will plead for their newly found Messiah to return and deliver them. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, Zechariah 12, 10. See also Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 9, Matthew 23, 37 through 39, at which point their deliverance will surely come, unquote. And so again, the context seems to be of a group of people, Daniel's people, who fully and finally recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. He goes on to suggest that Israel's leaders will finally realize why the tribulation has fallen on them either from the Holy Spirit's enlightenment, either understanding from the scripture, either the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists or the testimony of the two witnesses who are spoken of in the book of Revelation or from some of these sources or from all of these sources. The redeemed Jews then enter into Christ's millennial kingdom where the promises for Abraham and Joshua and David concerning the Messiah are finally fulfilled. And so now we push just a little bit harder and further the revelation of the fourth beast. Now, again, I, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is because Daniel says, okay, I'm going to skip over these first three beasts, but I still really, really want to know about this fourth beast. You'll note that even as Daniel asks the angel the question, the angel focuses on what I've just spoken to you. 
What I've just spoke, the first thing out of the angel's mouth is the kingdom's coming and it's going to last forever and ever. Why is this important? Not just for angel and not just for Daniel. Why is this important to you? I'm going to suggest to you that in the, that last verse, you're in that verse. You should put a parenthetical note on that verse and say, am I in that verse? Am I part of that? Am I one of the saints that's going to inherit the kingdom and be there forever and ever? Now pause as you consider who you are and where you fit in the passage. And now in verse 19, you might be saying, no, I'm more in verse 19. I want to know the truth about this fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with the teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, whatever this kingdom is and however it operates, it's brutal and it destroys and the 10 horns that were on its head and the other horn, which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth. And remember in our last study, I told you that eyes speak of human intelligence and the mouth which speaks, now we understand it's a mouth that speaks against God, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Oh, this is new. In the earlier revelation, he's a little horn. In this revelation, he's grown up. He's grown up. He's become stout, whose appearance was greater. That's the idea. In other words, whatever this little horn is, it's now become the chief horn, greater than his fellows in verse 20. Verse 21, I was watching. And that expression in the original language is, I was looking intensely, and I kept on looking. And I kept on looking. So it seems to indicate a profound consideration. And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. This fourth beast is substantially different from its predecessors. All the kingdoms were marked by conquest and cruelty. But this fourth kingdom exceeds all the previous kingdoms in corruption, in conquest, in cruelty. Daniel wants more information. And so more information is disclosed. The physical description is repeated from the earlier passage in the chapter with that one important difference. His appearance is greater than his fellows. He's grown. The 10 horns are on the beast's head. One emerges, three fall. The horn with eyes and mouth speaks. He grows in significance. He eclipses the others in glory and power and strength, and then we find something else that's troubling. He makes war against the saints and prevails them, prevails against them. Why is this important? This is new. Again, why is it important? Because whoever he is and whatever he wants, he hates the saints. He hates them. There is a profound opposition on the part of this person. He hates the saints. He declares war on the saints in verse 21. And this becomes a major point of the inquiry. Daniel sees this brief period in the last global tribulation. And the apostle John speaks of this event in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Um, next week, we're going to look a little bit closer at verses 1 through through 13 but in verse 13 or chapter 13 verse 7 in the book of revelation it says and it was given unto him that is the little horn the antichrist figure it was given to him to make war with the saints 
and to overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds, that means tribal groups, tongues, that means language, nations, ethnos, that's people groups scattered throughout the planet in order to understand the timing of this global persecution, you need to read Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, and again, Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, because now all of a sudden, remember, we begin to understand that these are events that are pushed further and further back. The Antichrist is able to persecute and prevail I'm going to suggest to you against believing Jews and Gentiles for a season. Again, when you're reading this passage, this is the time when you should go, time out, wait, stop. What are you saying? There's a battle, a profound battle. It's a battle between good and evil. And there are enormous casualties among the saints. Now, we know that in every generation in history, people have been martyred for their faith. It was profound in the first century. It died down in the third century. In the last century, which most of you visited, if you lived more than 18 years ago, from 1900 till The year 2000, more Christians died on the planet Earth in the last century than the sum and the substance of all of the centuries that preceded it. And I wish I could tell you that's as bad as it's going to get. It's never going to get worse than that, but it wouldn't be true. We can expect more. We can expect more in the future. According to Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture with all my heart. I believe that Jesus could come back at any moment with all my heart. But we're kidding ourselves if we believe that we're exempt from pain and suffering and persecution. We're kidding ourselves. If we think that the only people who are going to be hurt are the Christians in North Africa who get their head cut off, or the people who are imprisoned in North Korea, or the people who are imprisoned in Saudi Arabia, or the people who are being imprisoned in China at this very, very moment. There are saints right now who will forfeit their life. And there are many more who will forfeit their life in the future. So with humility and tears, let us remember the words of our Savior in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Be faithful unto death. And I'll give you a crown of life. He says... Saints are suffering. And Satan at this very moment is waging war against the saints. Which means he's waging war against you. But one day the pretense is going to be gone. One day the war is going to be open, intense, and violent. But according to the passage, the little horn's reign of terror is going to be short-lived. It will last until the appearance of the Ancient of Days and the personal return of Jesus at his second coming. The little horn will appear unstoppable, invincible, until the King of Kings shows up, stops the attack, and then renders a divine verdict in favor of the saints. The Lord Jesus will avenge their persecution. He will give the saved remnant safe passage into this future kingdom. And remember already I've shared with you a little bit about this future antichrist. He's called many things in the Bible. He's called the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 25. 
the prince who will come in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, the man of sin and the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the king with a fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. He's called a vile person, Daniel eleven twenty one, 21, which means reprehensible. It means corrupt. A willful king in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. The wicked or the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. He is called the beast in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And so far, here's what we learn. He arises out of obscurity to a position of great authority. He briefly rules the nations in Psalm 2, Daniel eleven thirty six, 36, Revelation 13, 16. And he will be utterly crushed by the coming of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah is right. Especially if you've ever been hurt by wickedness or evil. If you've ever been wounded because of the wickedness of another person, we begin to understand that there is a consequence. He is the first creature thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 19 verse 20. The question that Daniel has about this bizarre vision is going to require further explanation. And the angel is going to provide the answer in part. The fourth beast is different from the other beasts in power, in terror, in unity, in organization. The first power in Babylon will be localized. The second power, the Medes and the Persian, will expand. The Greeks will also expand. The Roman Empire will expand. But this beast, this final beast, will devour the whole earth. The Roman Empire never conquered the whole earth. Much of my adult life has been in study of that empire. From its nascent beginnings in the 2nd century BC to its consummation in the 1st century and the height of its authority in about 131 during the time of, of, of Hadrian. Julius Caesar took a crack at conquering the world. Augustus expanded that world. Hadrian pushed it further than it had ever been. But Rome never conquered the whole world. Rome's territory stretched from England in the Atlantic to the Euphrates River. It stretched from Gaul to the north shores of North Africa. But but Rome failed to subdue the Scots. If you're from Scotland, good on you. They didn't subdue the Gauls or the Parthians or the Scythians that were north of the Black Sea. The Romans were held in check at the Secaucus Mountains. They never subdued the Armenians. They never penetrated further than the deserts of the Sahara. But Daniel sees a kingdom and a king who subdues the whole earth and prevails against the saints. Daniel sees the Ancient of Days come He sees a judgment in favor of the saints. And what is that judgment? The little horn's kingdom is crushed. And the kingdom of the Most High remains forever. And there is the taking or the possession of that kingdom. And I want to draw your attention in conclusion to that final glorious phrase. Look what it says. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. The time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. When I was a kid growing up, it wasn't unusual on any given week to hear bands walking through the streets of New Orleans singing, Oh, when the saints go marching in, Oh, when the saints go marching in, Oh, yeah, I want to be in that number. Think about that. You hear the song, but imagine just for a brief moment that you believe it. That there's a kingdom that we're marching into. 
that we will embrace. In Matthew's gospel, we read about the kingdom of heaven some 30 times. The kingdom of God is mentioned some five times. Some regard the phrase as identical because of the similarities. That is, scholars look at kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, and they say they must mean the same thing because they have so much in common. Both are established on the earth. Both are associated with mysteries. Jesus associates the parable of the leaven with both of them, but there are some distinctions. Number one, the kingdom of God can only be entered by the new birth, according to John 3.3. 3. The kingdom of God is eternal, Daniel chapter 4, verse 2. Here in Daniel chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 1, only the saved are in the kingdom of God where they are safe. When you're in this kingdom, you're safe. You're secure. The unsaved are briefly found in the kingdom of heaven where they're judged and then they're cast out in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. In Matthew and Mark, we learn that the kingdom is not yet visible, Mark 10. Jesus, in speaking to Pilate, he said that my kingdom is not of this world, not at that particular point, but that his kingdom is in heaven and that if, he, if, if, if it were possible, his subjects would fight for him. And according to Matthew chapter 6, it's a present reality. And when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done. He, it, was about, it, it was about God's spiritual reign, not Israel's freedom from subjugation or political independence. God's kingdom was announced with Abraham's covenant. God's kingdom, according to the New Testament, is present in every believer's heart. And we discover that the kingdom values are different from human values. The kingdom's going to be revealed, and citizenship in that heaven, in that kingdom, is the believer's most present and precious possession. It's the Lord Jesus. Who determines who's in the kingdom and who's not? Jesus is the king who has come. And the king who is coming. And he's decided who's in and who's out. What are we to make of all of this? I think it's safe to say that the kingdom of heaven is that place where God rules. I think it's safe to say that the kingdom of heaven is that place where God establishes his sovereign throne. You know what I wish? I wish I could give you this amazing description of God's kingdom and heaven's kingdom, but the text darkens. It goes pale. We're given a glimpse of a horror and a terror. A human government that destroys and envelops the world. Later in our study of Daniel, I'm going to give you three more significant facts about this future fourth beast. He's going to devour the whole world. It's going to be a global empire in verses 23 and 24. He's going to defy the Most High God. That's verse 25. He is going to be literally destroyed by the Most High in verses 26 and 27. And when Daniel catches his breath and he exhales, he is terrified in verse 28. When I was driving along Hamden Boulevard, there's a great big placard that reads, fear is contagious, but so is hope. So is hope. Fear is contagious, but so is hope. 
Because you see, according to the Bible, this isn't the end of the story. The end of the story is your king comes where you are his constant companion forever and ever. In both Daniel and Revelation, they were both written not to terrify, but to give hope and to patiently endure suffering, knowing that our king is in fact king. And when your world seems to spin out of control, I want you to remember what you're reading. No, my king has come. My king is coming. And it's okay for you every morning, every morning to open your eyes and say, today, maybe this day my beloved will come. We're going to have communion in just a moment. I want you to just take the time and we're going to all participate together. Um, the worship team is going to come up and while we're doing worship, I... And while they're preparing, I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. You know, the Bible, when Jesus, on the night the Bible says that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take this and eat it, all of you. This is my body, which will be broken for you. He also took a cup. He gave thanks and praise. He said, take this cup and drink it, all of you. This is the cup of my blood. The blood of the new and the everlasting covenant, which will be shed for the forgiveness of sin. And one of the gospel writers places in the mouth of Jesus, I've wanted to do this for such a long time with you. And he says, guess what? I'm not going to do it again until I do it with you in the kingdom. We believe that Jesus is present, really, spiritually. But one day, one day, you will be at a gigantic celebration where Jesus will place a new cup in front of you. And Jesus will say, let's celebrate. Because guess what? Your citizenship is now redeemed. And what Jesus has promised you will come to pass. You will be his forever companion. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He shed blood so that we could experience forgiveness and hope. Lord, for that person who's never experienced it, Lord, I pray that they would pray that simple prayer. No, this is what I want. I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to have a right relationship with God. I want to be changed. I want to participate. And I want to be able to sing the song when the saints go marching in. I want to be in that number. And so, Lord... We think about and we remember our King who has come. And Lord, even as we partake of these elements, we think about our King who is coming. And once again, we take these elements as a declaration and belief that you are in fact going to return. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake.